Uh, next up, if we can get the title slide for the next speaker. So, yeah. Oh. Oh, is that the title slide? Wonderful. Uh, all right, everybody. I want to, uh, everybody to give a big hand to Matthias. I do not know how to pronounce your last name. I'm so sorry. Uh, but this is, uh, he, he's from Riot, uh, the Research Institute for Art and Technology in Austria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, how does this work with the queue? Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Matthias from uh, the in Riot Institute. And um, because I have a little bit of a jet lag, um, I decided also to put my slides online so you can possibly download them because I'm also, I also will be referring to a lot of um, texts and um, other things that I was previously writing. Um, how does that work, actually? Uh, okay. Yeah, so just to briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Matthias Tarasiewicz, or Parasev, um, as I'm called on IRC. I'm working as a research designer and te a technology communicator, and I have a background in computer science, hardware hacking, and design. And I'm also director of the Riot Institute. It's an NGO uh, operating in Austria. We are working mainly in trying to bring privacy technology to the people, and also um, do a lot of educational program, and we work a lot with hardware as well. So open hardware is one of our key topics. And I'm also board member of the Open Source Hardware Association, so I want to also contextualize uh, my talk a little bit with Monero Open Hardware. So I'm also running the Monero Meetup in Austria, and I'm also co-organizing the Critical Decentralization Cluster in, uh, at the Chaos Computer Club uh, Annual um, com uh, Chaos Communication uh, Congress. So actually, um, I will talk about that a little bit later. So how does that work, actually? Is that trick with that? With Okay. Yeah. So um, again, uh, to um, uh, stress the fact that I've, uh, I have a little bit of a jet lag, so my, all my slides are online, and I will be referring also to a few books. Um, for example, to this uh, recent book um, that is also now available online, it's called Openism Conversations on Open Hardware. And this was a um, book that explains a little bit um, how we work also as an institute. So we, int we interview a lot of um, technologists, people working with technology. This is also how we learn and uh, understand the, the methods of the, of the research and of the people involved. In this case of the Openism book, we have been interviewing a lot of people um, that are active in the open hardware scene and that are um, working with different um, concepts of open sourcing hardware because it's not a, an easy task. I will explain that a little bit later. So. Um, my talk is called Critical De Decentralization, Open and Libre Hardware for and with Monero. And uh, my structure of the talk is I will talk a little bit about critical decentralization, what is that term. I will um, talk about hardware hacking and device liberation as methods for technological literacy. And I will um, make sure um, to a little bit um, um, make sure that you understand what are the limits and challenges that are in the open source hardware space because it's not that easy to open source hardware. It's not the same as with software and it's very challenging. And I will also try to figure out and explain why this is relevant to the larger more narrow landscape. So um, first of all, to explain a little bit critical decentralization, the term, because um, we have been organizing this um, kind of crypto table. It started like a very small thing that was actually five years ago uh, introduced at the Chaos uh, Communication Congress, which is a kind of a hacker congress appro approximately as large as the DEF CON. Not that big, but um, I would say it's um, quite large. So 20,000 people come there. Um, every year, and uh, we started with a small table, and the last year, together with the Monero community, we could um, organize a very large cluster, which was actually 150 seats. So um, people were actually working there, doing workshops. Um, it's actually uh, con um, uh, different as assemblies that were um, meeting there and working there, mostly uh, from different open hardware um, projects, but also Monero project. We had RERA there, I'm seeing on the stage, that so was Kind of amazing, so we had a lot of um, program there. And this will actually happen again this year. And um, in this context, this, this term of critical de decentralization came up and was like um, actively discussed and debated by us. So this is how it looked. It looked it's a little bit sketchy and drafty and uh, looks very uh, uh, um, much like, um, um, like it is there. So you have a lot of tables, you have a lot of people working there for a week. And um, to explain a little bit why this term critical decentralization is important to me, so um, I think um, that um, the whole hardware debate and hardware itself 
and um, a problem that we have these days um, is lies within the devices we're using. So I think uh, there's a lot of a loss of control on the user side that basically makes it um, kind of um, a problem and decentralization cannot really move forward because we're losing the ability to understand our devices around us. So um, I'm referring to this book. I know it's an older book and you might already know it. It's from um, Jonathan Citrain who um, basically described um, that customers have been shifting from generative to tethered technologies because of perceived security issues. Um, what um, does Citroen mean with that? So he distinguishes between generative and tethered technologies. So generative technologies would be the, the early internet or Wikipedia some, somehow unregulated. And in a way you have these tethered appliances that would be for example the Apple App Store or something like end-to-end -end control of um, services, but also enforced by devices. That means these uh, tethered devices are also taking away a lot of um, properties that you would want as a user. For example, the iPhone, um, you cannot replace the battery so easy, so the whole repair process is basically only possible through the vendor. So the problem is you're getting uh, um, uh, dragged away, like all, all, all these kind of properties that you had with hardware that you were used to, or I was used to because um, um, I was um, able to repair my devices and use them around me. Uh, at all times, um, they're taken away from you. So in, the, in, in a way, this creates this kind of um, untethered uh, devices or tethered appliances, how um, Citroen calls it. And um, Citroen also continues to say um, that these kind of locked devices are also um, um, changing. And he refers also to the good old times, so to say, uh, when this was not the case. So the, the, in, in a time when people were more um, actually um, tinkering with their devices. And um, this um, actually reminds me of um, the situation we found in the 60s and 70s when um, basically um, computers were delivered and the, the whole uh, manufacturing process was, uh, was made for uh, enthusiasts, for tinkerers. So this, um, you would buy uh, computers as parts that you would actually assemble yourself. Um, the first computer that was really um, pre-assembled was the Altair 8800 in 1975 and um, the Apple I versus the Apple II is also a very good uh, explanation of that. So while the Apple I was a uh, kind of a um, um, device you had to basically uh, assemble yourself, the Apple II was coming pre-assembled. Uh, and this is, why is this interesting and why is this relevant in this whole context? Um, because um, these devices actually started the microcomputing revolution. The microcomputing revolution was um, insofar important as it introduced also the first availability of cryptography. So you had um, the Cyphers DES, RSA, and the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which actually um, enabled this kind of crypto dream, uh, how Arvind Naranjanan calls this. Um, and the, the question um, is like, um, um, I, I love it, it's, it's kind of a nice story when you, when you think this, this kind of um, technologies become available. So you have always these cycles when technologies become available and in a way they get regulated. So you have this kind of situation where, where um, this also happened of course in the, in, the, um, in the microcomputing revolution and also the availability of cryptography because we had the crypto wars of the 1990s. If you're interested in this um, um, topic more, I wrote a, a chapter uh, uh, in a book about that uh, which is called uh, Faceless Praxis in the Age of Zero Trust. Strategies of Disappearance and Distributed Pseudonymity in Art and Research. It's actually linked and you can also download it. Um, it's a very long text explaining a little bit about the cultural implications of, of, of microcomputing and also about the specific devices that were actually uh, in play. And um, I want to actually make a point here because I wanted to uh, make the point also with this, this book from Citroen that a closed devices reduce technological literacy. That's also what Citroen basically points at. And we can, um, um, these devices cannot be repaired anymore, so basically you lose something. So you lose some, some ability you had before. And um, in a way, um, all these kind of terms and all these kind of makey and makery attempts, the maker culture was, was really um, 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 on the rise and we, we, we always hear that makers can solve uh, a lot of problems, that they will actually save our planet and they will do a lot of things, um, is basically criticized a lot from, from all the different angles, even within the maker community itself. So you have this term, critical making, and I like this text from, um, or, or this text collection and book from Garnet Herz a lot. Um, he's making this taxonomy and distinctions between three different approaches of makers. So he um, distinguishes between a uh, utilitarian DIY um, and material constraint and pleasure, so a hedonized practice. So most of the uh, maker uh, uh, momentum and maker movement would actually work uh, out of a hedonized practice. And why am I telling you all this? Because this is important, because these are the um, target audiences for open hardware. These are the people that will buy your devices if you're an open hardware uh, a person uh, uh, trying to, to sell or monetize or distribute an open hardware project. So, um, oops, I'm always uh, pressing the wrong button here. Devices, yeah? 
So um, the right to repair is it something that's um, actually taken away from you these days. And this is actually also a political thing in the US. So um, I, I don't know if you're aware of that, but um, there's this uh, right to repair movement on repair.org. But uh, so it's really, um, um, and um, I was re recently reading up that you have this kind of right of repair with cars. So basically you can give your car to any uh, repair uh, uh, person, but basically, uh, and you can repair it yourself, but this is gets also like taken away from you. But with specific devices, with all these kind of tethered appliances, it's not possible anymore. You cannot repair your iPhone. You cannot repair your MacBook. I mean, you could, but you will uh, basically void the warranty and, and, and stuff like that. So there's a huge mo movement, especially in the US, which actually understands that it's also an ec economic force or an economic possibility in order to, to, to make this kind of repairability. Uh, again, a thing. So this is uh, also something which is um, um, a key property of open hardware. You can actually repair these things. You have the, the documentation you can repair uh, uh, however you want, and you can actually learn again. So um, uh, I'm also referring here to a very interesting text from uh, from a South American uh, researcher who was uh, writing uh, about uh, Gambira, a repair culture. It's also a very critical um, approach. So this was a, a kind of a um, group that started to um, uh, grab like old computers and like repair them and then give them to like social causes. So I, I, I like that a lot. So there's a lot of like different repair cultures now which are on the rise. And um, I'm, I'm also telling you this because repair is also a way how you gain a specific knowledge and how you can actually learn. Because this is actually these days, uh, uh, thinking about that hardware, um, this is a way how you learn about these things because these things are also heavily protected and you won't possibly find out anything without reverse engineering. So. Um, Repairing is a way to gain technological literacy, this so-called repair knowledge. And reverse engineering is an essential part to regain control over devices and also to learn. And um, I want to, uh, in this context, also refer to a, um, um, some uh, more, uh, to a book that was actually very important to me and also to, uh, to understand and to learn like how this uh, reverse engineering process is happening. Uh, which it's called The Hardware Hacker, Adventures uh, in Making and Breaking Hardware from Andrew Bunny Huang. And um, I love this quote from him. He says, without the right to think and explore, we risk becoming enslaved by technology. And the more we exercise the right to hack, the harder it will be to take that right away. Um, so um, bearing in mind that you might download this if you find this interesting, I'll also put a few links inside and some Easter eggs in the PDF. Um, so um, from reverse engineering to device liberation, there is a step in between. But we have to understand that re uh, reverse engineering is a necessary way in order to understand how machines work, how devices function. Because often you don't know how these things uh, are actually, uh, um, they're not documented. You, you want to get new no knowledge, you want to gain new knowledge, you want to actually possibly uh, re-purpose uh, um, uh, this specific device, you have to reverse engineer. So um, this is a good example, in my opinion, uh, explaining the process from reverse engineering to open uh, hardware. So this is a um, very interesting, in my opinion, community that started um, reappropriating um, cameras. In this case, it was um, Canon cameras, like normal photographic cameras, consumer cameras. And um, this group started to, it's called the, the Canon ha Hack Developer Kit. The, these um, guys started to uh, look at the firmware, uh, reverse engineer the functionality of the camera, and then reproduce another firmware um, so that you would be able to, to create like raw video or other functionalities of that hardware. That's, this is a very interesting aspect here because um, this is not the only project. So um, hardware hacking with cameras and firmware modi modification with cameras is a very common case. Um, or a lot of people do it because you can actually gain a lot of um, features out of these devices. And they are usually very costly. So professional cameras are very costly. And usually they're just limited by their uh, firmware. So you can totally uh, uh, crank the, the devices. Um, there's another example which is maybe uh, uh, more common, uh, Magic Lantern. This was a, a specific firmware hack in order to uh, make the um, uh, Canon DSLR cameras um, um, uh, able to record raw video, so the, um, the raw sensor data. It's a more uh, um, elaborate project already. And um, this kind of alternative firmware hacks, so this repurposing of hardware is a kind of a common practice. You find this a lot also in, in a specific audio um, cultures and interestingly um, a lot in uh, not maintained firmware anymore. So in Europe, for example, there was um, a movement now trying to f um, um, force uh, the producers of hardware to, to maintain the, the firmware longer because of course as a, as a consumer at some stage you, you cannot use these devices anymore. So a lot of people uh, started to reverse engineer the hardware because they wanted to still be able to use the devices. 
So um, I wanted to also point to another project here, uh, which is in the camera domain. I was uh, working with this project. And there's a talk um, about this uh, uh, project also from the 32C3, which is the Chaos Communication Congress back in the days, I think it was 2013 or something. So um, this is um, um, an attempt, and actually it's quite far the project already, uh, to completely and fully open hardware and open source a camera, a professional video camera, um, excluding the sensor, of course, because that's an also an important property to understand from open hardware it cannot be fully open. You will always have some proprietary elements in there because um, you cannot uh, produce uh, specific elements yourself. You will have specific elements that are uh, uh, copyrighted, that are patented. It's very complex and you have to deal with that. That's the first thing you have to deal with. So um, this kind of device liberation creates necessary techno technological literacy for open source hardware. That's, in my opinion, very important to understand because without this kind of information that is usually very, very uh, strongly protected, you wouldn't even know what to look for, you wouldn't even know what to design because this, all this kind of uh, information is, is hidden. So this also comes from a strong um, DIY culture, especially the, the, the video stuff I was showing. And um, I wanted to also here a little bit um, um, describe what open hardware is exactly and what kind of degrees of openness exist in this kind of devices and this kind of approaches. So. Um, this is a very good book if you want to get started. It's called Building Open Source Hardware, and it's um, written by uh, Alicia Gibb. There's also a lot of other um, uh, contributions in there which deal with the um, um, legal implications, with the documentation implications, with all sorts of things. I can give a brief overview um, uh, about what open hardware is, that we are talking about the same thing. And actually, I'm talking about open source hardware because there's already a, um, a differentiation between open source hardware and open hardware. So hardware per itself is born open. Uh, I'm quoting here Michael Weinberg, who was uh, writing in this book uh, about the legal implications of open hardware. So what does that mean, born open? It means um, that this open source hardware is um, fundamentally different than software. Because um, as software basically falls under the, the copyright law, um, basically hardware doesn't. Because um, hardware falls under patent law, that means it's actually considered a useful article, something uh, things that do stuff are basically, um, basically, um, you should you have to patent it. You cannot really make sure that this is like um, uh, not copied from someone else. That that sounds like a limitation, but it, it's not really because you have to just deal with it. It's basically um, there's other ways how people try to make sure that their hardware isn't isn't uh, kind of uh, stolen or like repurposed or sold. So um, a very good example is the Arduino case where they are trademarking the the term and then you print the, the, the trademark everywhere and basically um, people would actually identify that with your hardware. But basically they, can, they cannot really um, save any more than that. Um, there's a few other approaches um, which are outlined on the, on the lower part of the screen, which is the um, temporal license, which is from amateur radio um, uh, community in the US, then you have the CERN open hardware license and for open science and open hardware makes total sense because um, you have to somehow uh, reproduce and and uh, uh, um, make sure that these um, um, kind of um, measurements you made with open hardware are in a way reproducible. So CERN is running the Large, the large Hadron Collider. Um, it's the largest open hardware project. All of the devices they are storing the data uh, uh, from the Large Hadron Collider are basically uh, open hardware. And um, they produce a lot of data. Um, still also they are struggling with um, um, finishing or like making sure that all parts are in a way um, uh, kind of savable or like like um, 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 completely describable. So the the second draft of the Sun Open Hardware License is um, is now being drafted, and um, I'm much in favor of the GPL V3. So you can also um, uh, go with uh, Richard Stallman if you want to actually make sure that your um, um, open hardware is in a way protected, but also it it or at least it's as far protected that if somebody um, does something and, and extends your your designs that it has to be GPL as well. So here, um, um, I mean, you can read this yourself. I will uh, actually uh, quote him here. Um, for instance, a circuit, a topology cannot be copyrighted and therefore cannot be copylefted. So that's exactly what I, what I told before, what also Weinberg says. It's a problem because um, um, copyright um, um, only basically applies to artistic work and, if, and not to useful like, like things that do stuff. 
Um, definitions of circuits written in HDL can be copyrighted and therefore copylefted, but the copyleft covers only the details of expression of the HDL code, not the circuit topology it generates. Likewise, a drawing or layout of a circuit can be copyrighted, so it can be copylefted, but this only covers the drawing of the layout, not the circuit topology. Anyone can legally draw the same circuit topology in a different looking way or write a different HDL definition that produces the same circuit. It's another good example of, of, of how it's actually lost cause to try to, to protect these things. It's actually better to, to, to deal with the fact that, it, 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 that people steal it. It's good. Um, so um, I want to give a few more tangible examples that more relate a little bit to uh, Monero because I wanted to also make uh, a little bit more, uh, bring a little bit more clarity in this kind of open hardware debate because we're looking into a lot of uh, different open hardware projects also that, that are um, um, working with and, and mon working with Monero and the larger cryptoscape and people don't really uh, understand the um, basic differences between open source software and uh, open source hardware. So I hope I didn't bore you and uh, uh, maybe all of you knew already these facts, but I had to really uh, explain that again. So a few examples and here I picked three different hardware wallets, yeah, just to um, also relate maybe to the last talk. So um, we have the Trezor with the Bitbox and the Ledger. They are very, very different uh, uh, ways how they are um, basically marketed. So here you see not actually the open hardware part of it, here you see the final product. So the Trezor, for example, is open source hardware. We know that. We have the Bitbox, which is, um, uh, for example, open source software, and it has an uh, uh, HSM module. Then we have the Ledger, absolute closed source. I think the apps are open source or something like that. Um, but these things here, what you see is the, is the um, developer kit, and this is actually um, um, how open hardware is targeted. So that's, that's how the product looks that you would actually, uh, um, as an open hardware developer, um, deliver to the makers or to your first uh, a batch of like developers that will actually develop these things. So um, um, we're not looking at uh, basically this kind of polished products. We're looking at, at, at drafty things that people work with. And um, I wanted to give another good example because I think it's a very important example um, in, in relationship to, to Libre hardware because we have all these kind of different uh, differentiations about uh, what uh, and how open hardware can be. So there's like open hardware but there's like this one more uh, uh, step which is called Libre hardware. So we have Wi-Fi routes as best practice example and I wanted to give this example of the Linksys um, RT, uh, um, WRT uh, 405 g which is the best selling route of all times according to some sources. So um, basically um, this is an important router because it's, it basically made this open firmware system open UWRT possible. So it was um, possible because um, Linksys had um, built the original firmware on the GPL and so basically they have to um, uh, open source the, the whole thing. So people started to, to completely reverse engineer other routers and now it's a really large project. So I think they have like over 800 supported routers. It's a, it's a really large community looking only at the firmware. So they're not even designing the routers themselves, they're just re-modifying and like reappropriating the, the firmware. And that's um, very important to understand that this is actually an even maybe larger um, uh, community than even uh, hardware designers because it's actually a very, very cr a long lasting task and it's very expensive to build hardware, to deliver hardware and all these kind of things. So um, this is a good example insofar also because the Tourist Omnia, I don't know if you know this router, is a, um, is a very polished product. This is an open source router from the Czech Republic. and. Um, this is basically also running open URT. So um, this is, has like, some modules, you can extend it. So it's a very nice example. So routers are really nice in my opinion because you can see from 2004 until now like how these things developed and they have all these kind of different properties of open hardware. Um, here is a very good example. This is Libre CMC. It's um, um, a firmware project that works without uh, binary blobs. So the idea is, um, um, is there something more open than, uh, um, than open, yeah there is, because um, if all the drivers would be, um, if you have the source of all the drivers, you can basically check what, what they're doing, and most of the firm firmware these days comes with a lot of binary blobs, so you cannot really check um, uh, what's happening. For example, this is really a, a huge issue in the, in the open hardware space, um, because um, a lot of the uh, manufacturers don't um, give away, of course, the source code, so you have, you have to deal with all these kind of binary blobs at all times. So um, there is this one license, uh, um, uh, certification, sorry, um, which is called the um, FSF Respect Your Freedom Certification. And this is from the Free Software Foundation. I'm a really big fan of that because they really look into what um, um, the user can do with hardware in the end. And basically, um, there's a lot of interesting um, Monero-related or like let's say crypto-related open hardware that has this kind of Free Software Foundation certification. 
So because we, we heard um, about um, random number generators before, and um, there is existing really um, nicely produced uh, uh, um, random number generators that, that work on any device and that are even Libre hardware. So you can, you can see, okay, what's happening there. You can learn, you can rebuild it, you can even uh, uh, create your own uh, extra entropy devices. You can put additional sensors inside. So th that's existing, and that's a really good uh, uh, starting point if you want to dig, dig deeper into open hardware and Libre hardware scene. This is another good example. Um, it's the uh, Respects Your Freedom F, uh, FSF um, kind of um, remodeled device. It's an X200 laptop from uh, uh, IBM. And it's, it's old hardware, but this is actually considered to be the last hardware that um, runs without the Intel management engine uh, enabled, which means um, basically um, hardcore um, uh, cryptographers, like people that really want to make sure that their hardware is not compromised, would actually use this kind of old older devices because um, it's actually um, in a way, working with um, Libre Boot, so there's like Core Boot, Libre Boot debate. I'm not sure um, how uh, much this is like common knowledge, but um, uh, looking at other devices from the crypto uh, space that are like um, not uh, that are interested, uh, interesting, but not uh, uh, FSF uh, licensed. So we have the um, Nitro Key, which is a kind of an open hardware replacement for the Yubi Key, so the two-factor two authentication device, but it uh, has a little bit extra features. It's really nicely produced, but it's not completely certified under the, um, under the FSF uh, Respects Your Freedom uh, certification. And Purism hardware, a lot of people use that. I think also a lot of Monero people use Purism. is also not uh, um, uh, um, FSF uh, Respects Your Freedom uh, certified. And the question is why? Um, there's a very interesting debate on the Libre Boot uh, mailing list. Um, basically, the problem is the Intel management engine. You have this kind of backdoor, in, or kind of sort of backdoor. Um, people try to uh, basically remote shut down machines uh, through the Intel management engine. Some, there's some ex existing exploits, and uh, basically, it's not considered a completely um, um, secure device. So every, every Intel CPU uh, starting from 2008. So basically, um, since um, we are locked in into this kind of AMD or, or Intel or ARM devices, we don't know what they run. And basically, everything after 2008 is a kind of a chance that there's something happening in the background. So a um, little bit to conclude here. So um, I think um, Monero is already empowering a lot of best practices, uh, a lot of people, and uh, is showing a lot of best practices in security and privacy. But I suggest to strong endorse liberal technologies such as the uh, uh, FSF Respects Your Freedom certified hardware. I think people should actually know that um, um, privacy is a process and you need to actually actively look into what kind of hardware you use as well. So in my opinion, um, hardware is very unsafe. So in order to have a complete private and anonymous workflow, that means it's actually key management, everything, possibly without an, a hardware wallet, should be, um, uh, if there's a technological device uh, included, taken into account and there should be possibly some, some kind of um, um, yeah, endorsements, which kind of hardware to use. So I see a lot of um, uh, people who don't know um, um, exactly what kind of hardware to choose. It's, in my opinion, important to, to also, as a Monero project, um, um, define that, or like at least give a few endorsements. Um, and I also think we should reverse engineer existing hardware more in order to find out uh, if, if they're matching and, 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 and fitting in our security properties and security protocol. And I wanted to briefly also um, um, mention two things because um, um, this is interesting. My time is over, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, this is one thing that we are actively looking at at uh, Riot currently. So uh, um, it's um, the Risk Five open source processor instruction set specification. There's a few development boards built on Risk Five, and 90% of the packages from Debian are already ported to Risk Five, which is, uh, in my opinion, very interesting. Uh, Risk Five um, as the hardware itself is still in its infancy, but um, as soon as you can run Linux on a device, you can do a lot of things actually with it. Um, still, uh, performance-wise, you have to tweak a little bit, but I'm currently very interested in the uh, Keystor uh, Keystone Open Framework for architecting trusted execution environments where you can actually test and create a lot of interesting uh, um, uh, crypto um, features into like hardware. Uh, and basically, you can emulate this, the, 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 the whole production process on your machine. You don't need the hardware. So that's, in my opinion, an interesting direction the whole Monero hardware um, uh, uh, could go, or the Monero hardware team could go. Um, it has still a long way to go, and I think we should uh, still um, also see what kind of other options we have in, in using like secure hardware. 
Um, I just also, and this is my final slide, I promise, um, wanted to uh, point a few upcoming happenings where we are all meeting and where um, there's also something happening. So I wanted to point out the Hackers Congress Planetary Police, which will be in Prague uh, in October. Also in October, there will be the uh, Open Hardware Month. Uh, open Hardware Month means that there will be like open hardware events all over the place, all over the planet. I think there's a lot of happening in the US uh, and in Berlin, there will be like bigger events and a lot of projects will actually um, um, also communicate their, their findings and their, their projects. And there will also be, again, a critical decentralization cluster at Chaos Communication Congress uh, at uh, uh, Leipzig, uh, Chaos Computer Club. Um, you can find more information on this central community. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you there or any of these other things. Thank you so much. Everybody, uh, thank you again, Matthias. Uh, does anybody have any questions real quick before Matthias sits down? Yes, sir. Uh, you have a microphone. Given that we are actually in the United States, and the, this called lockdown of hardware started with the Digital Millennial Copyright Act in 1998, would you like to comment on the impact of that and the role of um, uh, firmware that is locked down with DRM or technological protection measures? And just for the sake of argument, we're talking about uh, criminal penalties or about 10 years in jail or a million dollar fine for breaking DRM. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is this is a problem. Of course, this is um, a problem in terms of like um, um, from a producer side, this is insane. And I hope we um, um, this doesn't affect uh, developers. Of course, it does, because I, I recently also read that if you are doing like uh, a cryptographic consulting in the U.S., you need some export license or something like that. So it's like insane. But I'm I can say that because I'm not, I'm not American, <laughs> <laughs> and I can export my crypto. I'll keep my opinion to myself. <laughs> Uh, again, thank you, Matthias from Riot.